28, verse 19. Everybody knows this scripture. Now in Matthew 28, 19, we're going to read this and then we're going to pray. We have a couple of prayer requests because uh, uh, I've just received a text for us to pray for a few things. So we're going to pray for those as well. But it says here, go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now if you look in that scripture, it doesn't say... Go ye into the world, pastors, preachers, pa uh, apostles, prophets, and teachers, and baptize them in the name of... It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye. Ye, when you transfer that into modern English, it says you. Go you, therefore. In other words, we all have that mandate. Every one of us in the church has the mandate to go ahead and spread the gospel message to other people. It is our mandate. You can't get out of it. You will have to answer to it when we are judged. You will not be judged to go to heaven or hell because you're saved. You're already saved. And as long as you keep your salvation, you will make it to heaven. You're saved. But when you go to face God, there is a, a throne of uh, uh, works. In other words, we will be given gifts for our commitment to God's kingdom. So it's a bit like this, if we both enroll in a company, two of us, we enroll in a company, and one person sells loads of houses, it's a house selling company, and helps the people and shows them the house and helps them deliver their furniture to the house and moves them in and gives them the new key and puts roses and you know, just goes an extra mile for them to feel good to go. And the other guy says, here's the keys and takes off. Who's gonna get the most reward? Yes, because they put most into the kingdom of God. They're going to be rewarded for the kingdom of God. They're going to receive the reward. And so it's the same thing with us. If we just, you know, we just want to be a bum on a seat. That's all. We just come and sit here and that's it. Never win a soul ever in our walk with God. We don't want to be using the altar. We don't want to be using the pulpit. We don't want to be using the music. We just, you know, we just want to give, we'll give a little money and come to church and that's it. Okay, you'll get a reward for that. No one's saying you won't. But you may not get as big reward as someone who's going out giving tracts, outreaching, praying, fasting, talking, amen, who sits in the church, don't keep getting up and down, up and down all the time. You know what I'm saying? But listening, amen. Man, you know, they're, 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 they're wanting, you know, uh, to learn. They're wanting to learn. Why are they wanting to learn? Do you know why, uh, why do you need to learn? I want, that's a question. Why do you want to learn the Word of God? Anyone answer that question? Sorry? You can go out and someone and teach about the Lord. Do you know why I wanted to learn the Word of God? The first motive, and it's a bit of a selfish motive in a way. I wanted to learn it because I did not want to be able to not answer a question when somebody asked me. That was my first motive to learn. My first motive to learn the Word of God wasn't to know God. It was because I wanted to be able to answer somebody if they asked me a question about God. I didn't want to use that horrible word which a lot of people do, they told me so. And think about it. How many times have you heard that they told me, they told me it's like this, he told me this is the way to be a Christian, he told me we need to be baptized, he told me, you, whenever you say like that, you are relying on somebody else's teaching. And if they got it wrong, you are going to get it wrong. You should never rely, like me, don't rely on me right now. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you what I believe in. But you better be able to check me out in the scripture. Because if you go and say, Pastor David told me we have to be baptized in Jesus' name. Pastor David never told you. Jesus Christ told you to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Because the word says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus. And the Bible said the word is Christ. Amen. But the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So in other words, Christ 
is telling you to be born again. Christ is telling you to be baptized in Jesus' name. Christ is telling you to come to church. Christ is telling you to give out tracts. Christ is telling you to win a soul. Christ is telling you to fast and pray. Christ is telling you, not me, not UPC, not this organization. Amen. Amen. But Jesus is telling you to do that. Jesus is the one who's asking you to expand this kingdom. Amen. For he said in Samaria, we know this, after the will, and he had that uh, confrontation with the lady, he said, looked on the hills, he said, the harvest is ripe, ripe or white, you know, and the reason why they said white was because in Samaria, they all dressed like Kibaloi in white. Right. Kibaloi is a uh, uh, fanatic in the Philippines. And they're all dressed in pure white in the Samaria. So 2,000, 3,000 people come out to the well because a woman came and brought the whole city, the Bible said. And Jesus said, look, the hill is white for harvest because they're all in white. Do you see? But the laborers are few. Why? Because said, nobody wants to do it. I want pa You know what? I want pastor to preach, teach, prophesy. I want him to build a church. I want him to pay everything. I want him to do everything. And I'll just come back. I'll just show up. I want him to do the whole work. So, you know, the fact is we are all part of this. Amen. We're all Amen. part of it. And we need to be part of it. And we need to be participators. Not just coming to the church, but praying. I admit we cannot bring anyone to the church. It's impossible. It takes prayer. And prayer, sent, uh, uh, sincere prayer. God, I want to win a soul. I want somebody. I want you to lead me. Some and I know some of you said, but Pastor, I've already led somebody. And they're fanatics, mental, ridiculous, stealers, thieving, cheaters. Right? Doesn't matter. You haven't yet been given the soul. These are just decoys. Do you understand what a decoy is? Somebody to throw you off your faith in a way. They're not the real McCoy yet. Do you not say it? Maybe the devil listening to your prayer too. I can't say he is, but what if he is and sends you people who are not really going to serve God, hoping that you will stop praying? Because if you stop praying, that one who's just a few people down the road could be an Apostle Paul who could come and get converted in this town and turn this whole city upside down. That's right. By your prayer, you may say, well, I'm nobody. How can I? Ananias, who was he? Who was he? Who was he? And what did he do? He just laid hands on the greatest apostle, probably, in the New Testament. He wasn't anybody. We never even heard of him before that, did we? I think he showed up somewhere, but he wasn't important. But God called him and said, you go and pray for Paul. You know, Paul? Oh, huh? Saul? Why well, Paul Saul? Saul? I'm not going to pray for him, he's a maniac. Do you know what I'm saying? And so God has been sending us a lot of maniacs and crazy people. How do we know one of them isn't a, a Saul or a Paul? Right now you may say, Pastor, it's impossible. Well, of course, it's impossible. But we have to keep praying. We have to keep praying and pray Amen. without ceasing and pray. You know, we have to get to the point that we get depressed, not in a bad sense, if we don't get a fruit. Not get used to it. Never get used to it. Never get used to it. Never. I am not used to it. I get desperate if things aren't happening. Because I'm preaching to you now. Amen. 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 Because that's what God has called us to do. Right, we're going to stand and pray for this Bible study. And I just want to pray for these prayer requests here. Amen. Prayer request was sent, and I'd like to read them to you, and we'll just pray for it collectively. Uh, we're going to pray for uh, to some people in India. Their churches have been burnt down. Mm -hmm. So we want to pray for some uh, apostolic believers in India. Let's just pray that God will bless them and give them freedom from the persecution. Let's just pray for all of our New Life family, that God will bless us all. Our churches will be unified and together. And let's pray, too for protection for Grinton Hall Christian School. This is a school, if you've been seeing the media, where Ofsted sent in a load of uh, what I would call wacko people and asked eight-year-olds what a lesbian was. And because the girl couldn't answer it, they have now turned around and tried to close this Christian school. Because an eight-year-old girl couldn't answer somebody what a lesbian was. 
That's the world we're living in. And the reason why that world is like that is because the Christians in the country are all asleep. Listen, there's an old saying here yeah, that the uh, uh, evil can only work if those that are righteous do nothing. So the churches of this country are sleeping. They're all busy. Amen. And that's why the devil is taking over everything, taking our schools. And it may not affect you. You may say, it doesn't affect me. But it will in the future. It will in the future. And that's why we need to keep praying. Amen. And pray that God will, uh, you know, lead. when you pray for a, a soul, pray for specifically, Lord, give me somebody who will serve you. Let them be a prayer warrior. Let them be an evangelist. Let them come in, Lord God, and, 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 and really help this work. And if you haven't got an answer in 10 years, keep praying it. Because you might get the answer on the 11th year. Now, you may turn around and say, but Pastor, I prayed and prayed. But some of you prayed and prayed for a church in Western, and here it is. Am I correct, Myra? Yeah. You prayed for a church in Western. Didn't you, sister? And now it's in front of your eyes. Can't deny the power of God. Am I correct? So if he can give you a church, surely he can give some souls as well. Amen. Amen. Keep praying it and believe in it. Amen. That's what God wants is faith to believe. Praise the Lord. Is this working? Amen. I'm not sure it is. Lord, we want to lift up this Bible study to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We ask Almighty God that you would open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirits. Lord, allow us to understand the words that we're going to speak today. We don't just want to hear them and let them fly over our heads. We want them to go into our hearts that we can repeat them to somebody else, Lord. It may not be the way I, I uh, address it right now or present it. But as long as that message can come out, Lord, because your word is a two-edged sword, which pierces even down to the marrow, we pray, God, that revelation of salvation would be upon us tonight in the name of Jesus. I want to pray to God for these prayer requests that came in. We pray for New Life Fellowship and all of our churches. We pray for our Sunday schools. And we pray, God, for this world school, Lord God, who is under persecution by a bunch of worldly people who don't even know you, Lord. And I rebuke them in Jesus' name. And pray, God, that they, Lord God, would not be put to shame for standing for the gospel. Amen. For, Lord, your gospel is a power. The word of God is like a fire in our hearts, almighty God. And we're praying by the power of Jesus Christ that your word will go forth, Lord God, and penetrate these ungodly people. That they will see that they are on the road side and they need themselves to be converted in the name of Jesus. We pray for this school right now that you will give them great favor Lord God in the sight of this ungodly government Lord God and pray God that your word will be vindicated in the name of Jesus Christ and bless us Lord bless every one of us in this church with a soul in Jesus name bless us with a soul in Jesus name I want a soul I want a person I need one. I don't need ten. I don't need twenty. I need one person that will come to this church, that will be baptized, that will be filled with the Holy Ghost, that will come again and again and again and again, that will learn your word, that will be built up in your word, that you can use for your glory. Oh my God. Hallelujah. I pray for this in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of Jesus. Everybody say amen. Amen. So keep your ears open and your eyes, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I'm not desperate. I'm and then turn it back and then turn again and say, for a soul. I'm desperate for a soul. Amen. All right, let me take your seats. You have to be desperate sometimes. You have to be desperate. And you've got to show your desperation for God. Like I, you know what? When I was in Victoria, I got so tired of doing the same thing. I was desperate for growth. And suddenly, out of nowhere, we exploded to where we are today. But I still want more growth. You cannot become complacent. Complacent means after a while, when you don't get what God wants, or you're asking and you don't get it, you give up. You just give up and you just do the motion. You just show up, la la la, go home, sleep. Show up, la la, go home, sleep. Show up, la la, go home, sleep. You just become complacent. Amen. And it's easy to do. All of us can do it. Nobody sits there and says, I'm not like that. We can all do it. Every one of us. It's easy to fall into a system. Amen. Now, how do we change the situation? Not by going out on the streets but by praying, because prayer 
is what changes the whole environment. Jesus said, I have prayed you, Peter. Satan has desired you, but I prayed that he wouldn't get you. And when you get reconverted, when you come back again, he said, he said, don't worry. He said, strengthen your brethren. In other words, Jesus was saying, you're going to fall, Peter, but you're coming back again. Do you know what I'm saying? And he knew it through prayer, do you see? And Jesus said, he said, receive you the Holy Ghost. Amen. And they, they got the Holy Ghost. And he said, Peter, I'm giving you the kingdoms. Uh, uh, and, and I want you to go and preach. And I want you to teach your brethren who will then go and preach. And he said, there, will, there are people who will come into the kingdom of God through your word. In other words, Jesus was speaking about us. We are here today, not because of the UPC. We're here because of Peter the Apostle. We stand here today, not because of the doctrines of the UPC, because it isn't the doctrine, it's the doctrine of the Bible. And we stand here because Peter preached to somebody, who preached to somebody, who preached to somebody, who preached to somebody, who preached to somebody, preached to somebody, preached to somebody, 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 we stop comparing ourselves with all these coffee-making churches, amen? We're nothing like them. That's why it really stirs me up when people compare, well, you know, we're nothing like them, amen? amen. We have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, sir. Help us God, amen? That's what we've got, and that's it. That's, that's what makes us different from any other church in Western Superman. Amen. We have the whole truth and nothing but the truth, amen? That was your beginner. Now, let's get on to the plan of salvation. We're just going to quickly do this last page on here. Brother Sam already did it, but he requested for me to go over it again. So first, you must know that God loves you. Amen. God loves everybody. Everyone that ever hurt you, Sister Stella, God loves them, believe it or not. He loves everybody. He loves the wicked person, because he said, I make it rain on the good and the evil. He loves the... He loves the uh, uh, the hunchback, he loves the Chinaman, the, the Japanese man, the Englishman, the Jamaican man, everyone. He loves them all. He loves the best teacher you got. He loves the one you hate. He loves the one you love. He loves your mom and dad, even though sometimes you don't when they're correcting you. Amen. But he loves everybody. Praise the Lord. So you must know that God loves you. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16. Rachel, you can stand up and read that because you've been late. Amen. You look good and loud. Praise the Lord. I know. Yeah, you can say I'm terrible. I am. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God so loved the world. He loved the world, the Bible said, and everything in it, and that's all generations too. That's every human being and every animal and tree. Do you know, he said, two sparrows fall on the floor, and doesn't God know about it? He knows about everything. This is his creation. So God loved the world. Now, a lot of people use that scripture as a salvational scripture. That scripture is not a salvation in itself, but it's part of the process. Basically, God is saying, I love you. Now I'm going to show my love in action. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like if I say, I love you, Gwen. Now I'm going to show my love in action by what I need to do to please Gwen and, and to make sure that she's happy. Do you know what I'm saying? Telling people you love them and then doing nothing about it or completely disobeying them all the time, you're better off never to say you love somebody. Because really what you're doing, if you really love them, you will follow what they're asking you to do. And God said, he said, I love you. And then he goes on and says in the Old Testament, he said, my rules are not grievous, but they are if you want to commit evil. They are grievous. If you want to be evil, God's rules are grievous. If you want to be good, they're not that bad. They're not. Honestly. And so God, so here, secondly, you must realize that man is a sinner and sin separates man from God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When you are talking to somebody on the street, you have to inject that they are a sinner. I know you may say, but if I say that, Pastor, they will be offended. If you're on a roll and the Spirit is leading you and you are mad, you're talking about God, 
any time you talk about God, this is the biggest mistake most Christians do. Most apostolic Pentecostal Christians do. They never talk about the plan of salvation. You know, I heard UPC, you can't watch TV. And, oh yeah, but the Bible says, and oh the Bible says, oh yeah, but, and they defend that doctrine, yeah, and they've missed the whole opportunity. Oh, I heard your women are not allowed to cut their hair. Oh yeah, but the Bible said in the book of Leviathan, and the Bible said in the, and the Bible said, oh, okay, thank you, bye. And they never even shared about the plan of salvation. Do you think having long hair or short hair is going to get you to heaven or hell? Can anyone tell me? Can anyone tell me that? You know, you may say, but are you telling me, Pastor, if I have short hair, I'm going to be saved? That's not what I said. It's no. not what I said. Listen to what I said. When God meets somebody new, do you think them having long or short hair makes a difference to God? Not a bit. Not even a bit. More respectful person. Not a bit. Couldn't care less if they've got long hair or short or no hair. No hair. Amen. Right. Or if you've got a wig, couldn't care less. Do you know why? Because he's meeting man as a sinner. Amen. And it doesn't matter what he's done. The Bible says that the Son of Man will forgive all sins except the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So when you get pulled in, the devil knows our doctrines. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Amen. And do you believe the devil's stupid? No. Because if you think he is, you're stupid. stupid. He's smart. So what he does, right, he knows you're going to outreach on the high street, yeah? So guess what? He sends somebody down and says, hey, I heard you can't drink blood. <laughs> Amen. And you start defending that and arguing it and standing up. And you've got all the scriptures and you're right. No one's saying you're wrong. You're right. Amen. But all that time, you haven't <laughs> preached the gospel. You've just defended a pint of blood only. And I can see when you come in the church, amen, we're going to have loads of people come in with their pints of blood and give it up coming to this church, yeah? No. They probably eat their, uh, you know, what do they call it, their uh, black pudding every morning with their bacon and eggs. And you can say, they're sinning, they're sinning. Actually, they're not sinning. They're not, do you know why? They're already in sin. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. You can't tell someone to stop eating blood who hasn't yet been saved. That's stupid. Honestly. Oh, but pastor, we preach. We don't preach not eating blood. We preach the gospel. The uneaten blood is way down the road, man. Praise God. Way down the road. Way so far down you can't see it. Amen. So when you get sidetracked or cornered on one of these, you know, you've got to turn around and say, look, I don't really care about all of these, but I just want to tell you about the blood of Jesus. Oh, the long hair. I don't want to tell you about long hair on girls. I'll tell you about the hair of the woman that washed the feet of Jesus. The long hair she washed and drive the feet of Jesus. Praise God. Do you see what I'm saying? Because I want to tell you, why do you say, oh yeah, I said, how do you know you Oh, then. let them tell you how they know they're saved. And if they're not saved properly, then you just say, you know what, you're very close to the kingdom of God, but there just needs to be a bit more added on. Always avoid having arguments about tithing, about television. Listen, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with television. I'm a Pentecostal preacher, but some people, they become too, you know, yeah, you know what, you cannot be a hypocrite. You cannot turn around and say TV is wrong and yet sit on your computer and watch movies. It's pathetic. <laughs> it's stupid. You can't turn around and say pork is wrong, but I don't mean a I don't mind a bacon sandwich. Or a hot dog with pork in it. <laughs> Amen. You need to be careful of hypocrisy because hypocrisy can creep in. Do you understand? It creeps. It doesn't. Be, you don't become a hypocrite overnight. It creeps in slowly. The TV. What's wrong with the TV? The reason why they banned TV in America in the UPC in 1970s was because TV was becoming disgusting. Do you know what I'm saying? Swear words, cursing, magic and all that. And of course, nobody wants you to watch that. But if you're adult enough, amen, to separate the evil from the good, there's nothing wrong with television. 
But if you're still a baby and you need somebody like me to legislate over you, then that tells you what you are then, doesn't it? I don't need someone to tell me not to go to a girly bar. I don't need to have a rule in the UPC, you shall not have pornographic. I know it's wrong. Amen, I know it's wrong. Because the trouble is with pornography, which I've learned, if you keep looking at naked women, when you get the real thing, you will not appreciate it. Because once you get the real thing, it doesn't mean anything because you've already destroyed yourself by all the false illusion. Do you know what I'm saying? Amen. Always remember, the real thing is always better than what Satan gives you. Amen. That's a sidetrack. I don't know why I got on that. But anyway, maybe I'm talking to some of the boys in here tonight. Who knows? So we must realize that man is a sinner. We are all born in sin. May I tell you that we all want to sin. Every one of us here, I don't know what your weakness is, but every one of us here want to sin. Either our weakness is greed, our weakness could be pride, our weakness could be women, our weakness could be we don't ever want to give anybody anything. We're like so tight-fisted. I don't know what your weakness is, but you all are sinners in here. Every one of us. There's nothing you can do about it. Don't ever sit there and say, I'm not a sinner, Pastor. You're already a sinner by saying, I'm not a sinner, Pastor. Amen. We are all sinners. Amen. The Bible says that every single one of us, and if we would like to quickly, if you remember my message on uh, Sunday, if we turn to uh, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 7. Can anyone remember the scripture I quoted? No. No, yes, that, but the one before that. In 6.36... 2 Chronicles 6, 36. 2 Chronicles 6, 36. If they sin against thee. 2 Chronicles 6, 36. I'll give you more time to read. Yeah, we all got that? 2 Chronicles 6, 36. It said, if they sin against thee, and in brackets it says, for there is no man which sinneth not. Amen. You see? So the scripture speaks directly to you. So if you sit there and think, well, I'm a good person and I help people, I'm a nice person, then you're sinning there self-righteous. The best thing is just to admit it. I've already done that. God, I am a filthy, dirty, horrible, smelly sinner. There's nothing I can do about it. But you can change me. This is why people, and I'm not saying this against any of you that have been born in the UPC, but people who are born in the UPC and who have lived all their lives apostolic and not convert tend to do a little for the Lord because they've never really been in a life of real sin. They've had a big sheltered life, which is great. But someone like Jeff Arnold, who was a uh, uh, who went to honky tonk bars, drinking and boozing and everything, gets converted and goes mad for God. Why? Because he knows where he's come from. He's come from a pig pen. The ones who are born, you're not, you're, you're not there. That's why, that's why, in a way, you're the most dangerous of all. Do you know why? Because in a way, you're like Eve, blind. You can't see. You just walk straight into trouble. Us sinners who have been uh, converted, come out. We know what the devil's like, man. We've already danced with him for 20 years. We know him. We know what his lies are. We know how he dangles, you know, naked girls in front of us. We know how we walk through the park and someone will come up with a bottle of whiskey, just have one drink. We know it's, it won't be one drink. We know all of the tactics. We know because we've come out of it. We know, don't we? We know about drinking, brother. Yeah, I used to drink fishes down, man. I could drink more than a fish. It's true. So that's what I know. And so... You know, that's why you need to pray like Solomon's prayer. God, give me wisdom. Help me, Lord, to avoid the pitfalls. You have called me by my dad, in a way, or my mom. Because of my mom's righteousness or dad's righteousness, I'm in the church. It's okay admitting that. I'm in the church because of my mom and dad. But God, I still want to have a passion and a love for you. I don't want to serve you because my parents are serving you. Remember what I said yesterday. I don't want to walk with somebody who's walking with God. I want to walk with God myself. I want to walk with God myself. 
And that's what happened with Samuel. He had his own personal walk with God. God called him and he didn't hear the voice at the beginning. Once he got the voice and knew what was going on, then he uh, uh, responded to that. And we need to hear God. You know, God will overcome your weaknesses. You cannot overcome your weaknesses on your own. You must admit that to God. It's impossible because if you could do it, you would have done it already. You don't need God. Amen. And as a preacher preached on Saturday in the conference, yeah, we're adopted. God, God loves us for who we are, for God's so love. In a way, I'm not changing the scripture, but it could be for God so loved who you were and are that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. So he loves you already the way you are. Thirdly, Jesus Christ paid the debt for you and me. But God commanded his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So all your good favor, if you would turn around and sign over all your worldly possessions to Sister Rachel, amen, which no one's going to do that, but if you did, you would not be any closer to God than if you were when you're just sitting here. You know, you wouldn't. You cannot win God's favor by good works. You cannot. You must understand that. However, good works should follow a person who loves God. You do good not because you want people to see you doing good. Like you can go through the high street and say, Hey, hi, hi Steve, how are you? You know this person, I helped them, I gave them, I gave them, I gave that, I gave that, I gave that, I gave that. And I good. No, you don't do that. You do good things because you love God. Because the Bible said God is love. And if you're in love with God, and God is in love with you, you should express the same kind of character as the one you're in love with. Do you notice sometimes, I've noticed that sometimes people will fall in love with somebody, like a girl falls in love with a guy, right? And the girl's a smoker, and the guy isn't. And after a while, the girl gives up smoking. Not because she wanted to, but she does it because she loves, you know, the husband, the, the boyfriend or the husband. And so, in other words, his... His, um, uh, you know, he's, uh, he is, what's the word I'm after? Important. No, there's another word. Come on, guys. When you are, when you've got something over somebody, you've got to... Uh, Control. Influence. Influence. That's, oh, I'm getting young, man. His influence, his influence is so strong that it's starting to change her into his likeness. Do you understand? Stopping the smoking and stuff. And we can see that where a good woman comes into a man's house, like, like some men are really scruffy. You get a good woman come in, cleans the house, suddenly starts wearing nice socks now, we're cleaning the shirt regularly, jump saying, shaving properly, hairs but change. I mean, and people see them in a few years' time and say, gosh, you changed, did you? Yeah, because I married so-and-so. Amen. And her influence is so strong that people can see the change. And it's the same thing with God. God's influence is so strong on us that people see the change in us. They see we're talking about Jesus now. They see we don't swear anymore. They see we stop smoking. Not because we stop smoking because the law in our Christian world said, Thou shall not smoke. We stop smoking to please God. And because we want to live longer. And when we give, when we give to the Lord, we don't give because the uh, church is crumbling or we need to pay the light bill or what. We give because we love the Lord. We love Him. And we find this is the place where we have an encounter with Him. So we want to support whatever He's doing. Amen. Whatever God's activity is. Amen. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's why we do it. And we don't want to be seen to be doing it. We just do it because we love Him. Amen. And that's why I'm saying, be careful when you say, I love, I love, I love. Because God, you know, you've got to be careful in front of God saying to God, I love God, I love God too much. Because you know what God does, don't you? He tests you. He tests you. And you know, his tests are not simple tests. His tests are so deep that sometimes it's just too deep for us. Amen. He will find out if you really do love him the way you confess publicly. And let me tell you one thing God loves the most. Can you tell me one, can anyone tell me what does God love the most out of nearly everything? Hands up, don't just shout out. They want to follow him. Mm. Yes and no, it's not what I'm looking for. They admit that he 
need God. The what? The, you admit that you need Him. No, it's not. There's a, a word I'm looking for. One word. Humble. Four letters begins with O. Obedience. Obedience. Oh, we know that because in brother, in brother Samuel's book. Samuel, thank you for the dream. Uh, God said through Samuel to Saul, it is better to obey than to what? Sacrifice. What is a sacrifice then? What what is a the sacrifice is coming to church, giving you money, doing this, paying, helping everybody, paying. So for example, if I'm gonna give you a classic example, yeah? Pastor Sam turns around and says to Rachel, I want you to give five pounds to the Lord every week. Okay? And then she takes that five pounds and goes buy somebody on the street something to eat. Five pounds. Did she obey the Lord? Did she obey the Lord? No, she didn't. What did the Lord say? Give five pounds to the church every week. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's all, that's all you need to do. You don't need to take. Now, the problem is with some of us, they don't believe God knows what he's doing. Because they took the five pound and went, she took the five pound and went and bought the hungry five pounds fish and chips. So in other words, they're saying, the man of God don't know what he's doing, so I will now take over his position and go and do what I think is right. And that's why they end up getting in trouble. Now, how can you learn that? You can only learn that by sitting and allowing someone to teach you how to behave in the house of the Lord. Do you see? That's why the scripture said obedience is better than sacrifice. Come in, come in, sir, come in. You come in now, the minute you come in this door, you will answer my prayer. And you've just answered my prayer. Thank you. Come in and sit down, sir. Would you like a cup of coffee? No, I'm fine. All right, please. You didn't tell me you were the pastor at the shop. You never asked. <laughs> but take a seat, sir. Anyway, uh, so the point what I'm saying is obedience is better than sacrifice. And God, so when you stand up and say, I love God, I love God, God doesn't test you to see if you love him as in go to the church. No, he will test you to see if you will obey a command which you don't like. Do you understand? Because by doing that command, you show your love for God. You show your love for God, do you see? David, if you go through the scripture, every time David wanted to do something, the Bible said he inquired of the Lord. And when the Lord said, no, you cannot go, he didn't go. When the Lord said, yes, you can go, he went. When the Lord said, go around the back, he went around the back. When the Lord said, go up that way, he went that way. Whatever the Lord told him to do, he would do. So how do you inquire of the Lord if you've got a big decision? How do you inquire in the Lord? Maybe you just get a coin and go, heads God is with me, tails is not. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe you say, if I walk down the street and fall over, that's the Holy Ghost. If I walk good, it's the devil. How do you get your sign from God? Your pastor. Your pastor. But what if my pastor's a devil? Okay. If he's a devil, why are you coming to the church? Hallelujah. Yeah. Think about that. If he's a devil, why are you sitting in the church with the devil teaching you? Amen. You're not a devil. I know that. The point what I'm making though, the point I'm saying, if you're willing to submit to teaching and willing to submit to, then you should ask that what to do. Amen. 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 That's obedience. And one thing I've noticed about God, and I hate to say this, I don't mean this detrimental, a complete foolish idiot who knows how to obey and submit is better than someone with all the talents in the world and cash in their pocket. Always remember this, you don't know better than what God knows. Remember that. And the pastor you're under should always, and you've got a big decision to make, he should, and if you've got the right pastor, lead you through the word. It's important for that, do you see? But you see, some of us, we think we know better than God. Listen, if we knew better than God, we would have created God. Amen. And if you know better than God, if you know better than God, you would not have the troubles you've had in your life because you could have just sneezed and all your troubles would have gone. Amen. So, just remember that. There's a little injection there for you. Fourth 
You must realize that it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, which means the Gentile. So there is no other gospel than our gospel. Amen. And the gospel message is this simple, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel isn't, come here, I'm going to say a quick prayer and take Jesus into your heart, okay? Lord, in the name of Jesus, receive Jesus in your heart. Amen. You're now born again. <laughs> that is not the gospel message. That is not the gospel message. It isn't. The gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the message the devil wants to give you because if you walk away happy with that, he's happy. Listen, I don't mean I don't mean this in a funny way, but this is the only time you can really be greedy with God. God, I want the whole message. Amen. I want the lot. I want it all. Amen. I don't want five percent. I don't want eighteen percent. I want the one hundred percent undiluted word of God, and I want to know how to be saved. Completely, do you know what I'm saying? And so the death means first we accept we're a sinner, we must repent. Now, what is true repentance? Repentance isn't saying, Lord, forgive me for being a thief. You know what, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner, and gosh, one of my weaknesses is a shoplifter, and I'm so sorry. And the next morning, back on again, nicking. Amen. Repentance, I will show you exactly what it means. Repentance means this way. You are going to kill like this through your sinful, but you stop and ask God's forgiveness and you swing around and go back the other way. That's true repentance. That's how you know when you're born again. How can you truly tell that you're born again? Hands up, someone tell me. How can you really, really honestly tell if you've truly been born again and you've really repented? Change of heart. Yeah, but how that? Oh, anyone can say a change of heart. But how can you tell yourself? I repented when I was in prison for nine years. Okay. I don't want to get baptized. That's when I got into the Lord. All right. And where are you living for the Lord now? Oh yes. Yeah, You're going to church every week. Well, I've just come out ten days ago after nine years. Out of where? Prison. Okay. Out of prison. Okay. All right. Okay, so, okay, that's fine, sir. Okay, how can you really tell that you're born again? That's two great answers at the moment. Still didn't give me the answer I want. I'll put it in my heart. Nope, that's not the reason. That's not the way. I'm repentant. That's not the way. It's not the way, sir. It isn't. I'll tell you how. The only way you can truly know is that you change. If you're a smoker and you've really repented, you're not smoking anymore. If you're a thief and you're really repented, you're not thieving anymore. If you're loud mouthing people and swearing F you, F you, and the Holy Ghost has got hold of you, your mouth now is pure. Now sometimes you relapse, you know what I'm saying? That doesn't mean it's over, you repent, get back on your feet. It's not the actual relapsing of the sin, it's if you desire the sin. When we were living as sinners, we liked to sin. The Bible said we went out to rush to sin. Now, when you've been born again, yes, you'll commit sin, but you feel bad about it, do you understand? You don't feel good about it anymore. You don't think, oh, I just got those four ladies, hallelujah, praise God. You know, you're just like feeling guilty about it. You're pray repenting to God. You have your conscience, do you know what I'm saying, is bothering you, do you understand? Why? Because you've truly been born again. You cannot turn around and say, Lord, come into my life and then go down to the pub and get drunk and then turn around and tell him the next morning I love you while you're swinging a bottle of whiskey down? Come on, how can you win anyone to the Lord if your lifestyle is a lifestyle of the worldly people? Christ said, come out from among ye and be separate, says the Lord, and don't touch the unclean thing. Who's unclean? This whole world is unclean. The whole world is unclean. And Jesus said, I bought you with a price. I bought you from where? The world. That's why he said, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You have been bought 
out of the world. So when people see you, I don't want them to see some topsy-turvy, crazy idiot, doesn't know where they're going, what they're doing, don't know where they are, don't know how much money they got, afraid of the future, afraid. I want to see somebody, I want them to see somebody who stood fast in the Lord, telling everyone about the gospel, telling everyone I'm going to heaven, the Antichrist, I'm not looking for the Antichrist, I'm looking for Jesus Christ, you know what I'm saying? Uh, this kind of person who is grounded in the word of God, grounded in the faith of God, grounded in their future with God, and have changed, they dress different, they talk different, they act different, they watch different, they don't lie, they don't steal, they don't cheat, they don't do all of that stuff anymore. Amen. That's someone who's truly born again. Amen. You can't say, Lord, repent for smoking drugs, you know, reefer, you know, reefer is marijuana. Lord, I smoke in marijuana, forgive me, forgive me. And then the next day, you're up again. You didn't repent, really. Mm -hmm. wow. Amen. Amen. And true repentance is a turnaround. And you know, the sad thing is, we as Christians always focus on the outward sins that we can see, like the doing of drugs, or the smoking, the drinking, or the mouthing and swearing. But what about the sins we don't see? What about the rebellious spirit? What about the pride? Mm -hmm. What about stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Which we don't see sometimes. Those are, those are sins you don't see. But some people, gosh, they have them. Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then call themselves Christians, praise God. And then say, I was born again 15 years ago, Pastor. Really? Mm -hmm. You look exactly the same as you were when you were born again 15 Amen. years ago. Amen. You're still complaining. Yeah. You're still nagging. Yeah. You're still horrible. Yeah. You're still unforgiving. Yeah. You're still robbing God. you still got no trust in God. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The same old stuff over and over and over again. That's true repentance, see? That's why you've got to sometimes, you've got to sometimes, and, and come to my shop if you like, because we've got plenty of mirrors. Look in the mirror and ask yourself a few questions. Since I've been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, how have I changed from that day to where I am now? How have I changed? What have I been doing? What is my, do you know what I'm saying? What am I? And living in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. What am I? Do you know what I'm saying? Okay? And this is what you need to know. This is what you've got to know. You need to know. Am I the same? So, for example, let's say five years ago you were baptized, right? And five years ago, somebody upset you. Get angry straight away. And five years later, you still get angry straight away. And the Holy Ghost ain't dealt with that one, is he? Amen. Yeah? Let's say five years ago that you saw ten pound on the street. Yeah, someone dropped ten pound. They're walking. They dropped ten pound. Five years ago, pick it up, put it in your pocket, and walk off. Five years later, you still put it in your pocket and walk off. It ain't changed much. Five years ago, you'd never give to any cause for God because you say the pastor's running off with it. But now you never give any cause to God because you say the pastor's running off with it. So in five years, God hasn't changed you at all. Do you see? You know, you've got to have, that has to be changed so you can look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm really born again. Born again means a new life. It doesn't mean you can repeat the old life. If I was born a, a, a cow, amen, yeah, and I got born again and became a chicken, I don't want to be a cow anymore. Praise God. I'm a chicken now. Why would I want to go back and be a cow again? And end up as burgers. Hallelujah. <laughs> and that's the point I'm making. When we're born again, we're a new creatures. The Bible says, I think, is it in 1 Corinthians 5 17? Somebody stand up and read that, please. I'm going a bit long today because you're not going to get me this Sunday, so let me finish. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians, I think, is 1st or 2nd. I think it's 5 17 first. At 2nd Corinthians. I do apologize. 2 Corinthians 5.17, who's going to stand up and read it? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want you to read that, sir. Show him, Joshua. I want you to read that scripture, because when you said about being again, it's just in my heart. It's not just in your heart. That scripture, you need to read that Bible. Read it nice again. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ... Read it to him, Joshua. Just read it. To no, 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 I'll read it. Uh, 
as he's looking. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? He's a what? Therefore, a very individual is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, Behold. Behold all things become new. Yeah, thank you. So how can someone be a new creature if they were not an old creature in the beginning? Think about that. You cannot make something new unless it was old. That's why the Bible says God doesn't put the Holy Ghost in old wine bottles, but only new wine bottles. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, if we are a new creature, that means we must be leaving something old then. Amen. We must be leaving old, something old. What is the old? Your old attitude, John D. Your old way of life, Myra. Your old uh, uh, talking, Sister uh, uh, Stella. Your old, you know, whatever. I don't know. I don't want to go through everybody's, you know. <laughs> I'm just trying to make up things, you know what I'm saying? It's like, your old. Oh, yes, Dad, but you don't mean it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? These, these are all things which should be changed. So you bring glory to your parents? No. So you bring glory to the uh, New Life Fellowship? No. You bring glory to God. Because yeah, then yeah. God becomes proud of you yeah. in front of all the angels. He said, have you seen my servant Job? Huh? Job? Who doesn't do any evil? Yeah, he's only like that because you've got a hedge around him. That's the devil. That's the devil talking. Yeah, I bet you if I take the hedge away and take, he will curse you to your face. That's exactly what the devil said to God. And God was so confident in his man that he was, you know, converted, totally converted. He said, okay. You can do a try. Try your life, but you can't kill him. Do whatever you want. And in the end, Job passed the test.